Welcome everyone this morning. We are talking today about motion and how vehicles move through the environment. So what we have done so far were some basic introduction to probability theory as well as to coding to give you hands-on tools in order to start working. And then Nivet introduced last week the mapping with non poses approach. So the question is how to build a map if we have all our sensor data available, assuming we know our poses. And now we will gradually move into situations where the pose information is not available. The first thing we want to do for this is trying to describe how vehicles can move through the environment, so how to realize motion. And then we can, after we have derived the basic physics equations, we can actually think about how can we describe this in a probabilistic form so that we can take uncertainty into account, which then at some point in time will lead us to state estimation problems where we want to do locomotion information as well as sensor information in order to estimate the, for example, pose of a mobile platform in the environment in an online fashion. And so today we will be focusing on locomotion and we'll revisit some basic physics in order to describe how a wheel platform can actually move through the environment and how can we describe this appropriately. So wheeled motion or locomotion is one of the basic capabilities of, uh, of mobile systems. That means they have the power to actually move from one place in the environment to another place in the environment. And at that point in time, we are not yet talking about planning, in order to, about making smart decision, what is the shortest path from A to B. It's just kind of how can we actually move a platform from A to B. So if you think about wheels, this can be just a rolling motion. So a wheel that is rotating, and in this way, guides a platform from one place to the other. But there can also be much more complex ways of moving through the environment, for example, lag systems. <clears throat> in the end, it boils down that there is, in most situations, a rather small number of models that you can actually use in order to describe motion. So one of the simplest models is a so-called differential drive model. That's something that we will discuss in more detail today. It's basically a drive which consists of two wheels with two motors. And depending on how I actuate the motors, the system can go forward, backward, rotate, drive on curves, depending on the velocities that I put on those two wheels. This is kind of the st standard thing that is used for small platforms. The second drive, which is extremely important, is the so-called Ackermann drive, or Ackermann steering. This is basically the system that you know from a regular car. That means you have wheels that are fixed, typically the wheels in the back of your car, and then you have your front wheels, that way you can actually set a steering angle. And the question is how to set the, set the steering angle in order to generate certain types of motion um, so that you know on which kind of circular arc you're driving. And this is also the, the second extremely <coughs> popular one. So those two are the most popular systems that you can find. And then there are some more specialized cases if you need special navigation capabilities for certain systems. You have synchronous drives or even mechanical wheels, which is actually one of the super fancy drives um, which can allow you to do things you wouldn't imagine um, to do with a mobile platform like systems that have wheels on wheels, and depending how you control the wheels on the wheels, you can actually create sideward movements and, and different things, which can be important for navigation in confined spaces, for example. But first, so what we're looking here today is basically wheels. So we assume we have a platform with the wheels, and the wheels are standing on the ground. So in the end, it boils down to that we have a wheel. We can typically actuate our wheel because there's motor attached to it, and depending um, how I control the motor, the system or the wheel will move forward or backward. Okay? So if it's kind of in a 1D problem, if I actuate the motor in this way, the platform will actually move in this direction. That's kind of not a big surprise probably. It turns out, however, that it gets slightly more complicated when you have multiple wheels attached to a platform. And if you want to do more than driving on a straight line. So, of course, if all your wheels are parallel, you want to drive on a straight line, you actuate all your wheels in the same way, and your platform will move forward. There's nothing very surprising about that. But the question is, how do we need to control our wheels, or what happens if we want to actually drive a curve on a circular arc? Let's restrict our curves for this lecture to circular arcs. So, we want to drive on an arc. How are we going to do that? And for that, it is important how the wheels are arranged and which velocity commands are actually sent to my wheels in order to generate those movements. And one of the important insights is that we only get a rolling motion so that the wheels are actually fluently rolling and not kind of skidding over the uh, ground or sliding 
if we have something which we call an instantaneous center of curvature. This is basically one point where all the, the whole system turns around. So let's say we have a platform which has three wheels, this wheel over here, this wheel over here, this wheel over here. We will only, and we intersect those axes, we don't find a single point. That means for us, in this case, there's no way that we can actually rotate around here without any of those wheels sliding or skidding. So this is something which is not going to work. If we, however, can control our wheels or set up our wheels in the way that the axis always point to the same point, then we have something which is called instantaneous center of curvature. And this is a point where all the wheels rotate around. I can see this in this case as multiple wheels on the same platform, or I can even see this as wheels at different, or the same one system at different points in time. And the important thing is whenever we have a system which has multiple wheels attached to it, we actually need to make sure we control our wheels in a way that we generate this ICC, this instantaneous center of curvature. So only if we have this ICC, then all the wheels are running smoothly and we don't have side drifting effects, for example. So by setting the steering angles of those wheels, so those angles, and by controlling the velocity of those wheels, I will actually um, impact how the platform moves and I need to make sure, I need to control them in a way that I always have one instantaneous center of curvature. Okay? So it depends on how many wheels you have, how many degrees of freedom you have. Sometimes you can set velocities and need to take certain constraints into account, so called error velocities that should be zero. Um, sometimes this instantaneous center of curvature comes out naturally depending on your drive. That's something that we will explore in a few minutes. So are there any questions about the idea of this ICC or what this ICC is? So it basically means I'm going to drive on a curve and there must be a generate, the motion must generate a circular arc and there is one rotation center and if all the wheels are aligned in the way that the axes point to this rotation center and the axes intersect in this rotation center, then I will have a smooth motion. So consider I'm a mobile robot, let's say my legs are my right and my left wheel, and I want to rotate around this spot over here. So then if I connect the axis of my wheels, they intersect due to the setup in the same point, because my legs are kind of orthogonal to this, so I will be rotating, depending on my velocity, rotating around this point. If my wheels, if my legs wouldn't be attached in this way, but would be attached, let's say, in a slightly, slightly weird way, then those would not intersect in this single point. That means I would actually slide over the ground and won't generate a rolling motion. So we're interested in generating this ICC. And again, it depends on our drive if this comes out automatically. Uh, this is for the differential drive, as we will see in a second. There, this ICC is typically generated auto automatically, but there are other drives which have more degrees of freedom where this is not always the case, or where I need to take into account that I set the velocities in the right way, taking into, can, into, into account constraints because of more degrees of freedom um, in my actuation system. Okay, we can describe these things by a few very basic equations coming from physics. So we have something like the distance traveled is the velocity of my platform times the time I'm traveling. So if I'm going one meter per second forward for two seconds, I'll drive for two meters. Right? This is kind of very basic motion, no acceleration involved in here. Then I have something that the velocity that I'm actually driving, if I'm driving on a circular arc, is my rotational velocity times my, the radius that I have. You can see this on a, if you have a circle. Let's say you're driving on a circle. Then the parameter of the circle is 2 pi r. And so that means if you, so this is your radius r, that means if your velocity of 2 pi per second the rotation velocity of 2 pi per second, then the distance that you travel, so your actual velocity that you're driving, will be the 2 pi times the radius. So if your radius gets larger, you need to drive faster. Okay? So it's just basic equation which are stemming from the circular equations. And that our rotation velocity is typically the uh, change rate in my, uh, in my orientation um, over time. Okay. Let's start with the most basic drive, the so-called differential drive. The differential drive, this is one example of a system with a differential drive. 
What you see here, it's perfectly visible. Let's switch on that light here. So you have a big actuated wheel here on the right hand side of this platform, and you have symmetrically the same type of wheel on the other side. And these are the two actuated wheels that the platform has. In addition to this, in order to make the platform stable, there are some so called castor wheels attached here in the back. These are basically free floating wheels which can turn around like on a shopping cart. And depending on how you move the system, these wheels will rotate. So they are not taking into account in the controlling motion because it will adjust themselves. A slightly more trivial robot, but which has actually the same steering as this one, so you can see it slightly better. You basically have two big wheels, one on the left, one on the right hand side. And what you can do is you can set the velocity commands of those wheels independently. So you can give, there's a motor attached to your right wheel and a motor attached to your left wheel. And by controlling the motor for the left wheel and the right wheel, you can generate different motions that the system is actually executing. Now this kind of, again, one of the most simplest forms of drives that you find in a lot of systems because it has some quite attractive properties. So what do I need to do if I have this platform, if I want to move forward in a straight line? How do you think I need to set my velocity commands? Yeah? Same on both wheels. Exactly. I execute the same forward motion on both wheels. So both wheels rotate at the same speed, and then I will drive forward on a straight line. What do I need to do if I need to go backwards? Exactly, same back because it's symmetric. Okay, we have that there. So what happens if I want to actually drive on a, a curve? Let's say I want to do a curve to my left. So in this case, rotate to that side. What, uh, how do I need to control my, mo my motors? Yeah? The right wheel has to be a bit faster than the left wheel. Exactly, so the right wheel needs to rotate faster because we are rotating around some point, which let's say is like somewhere over here. So the distance that this wheel needs to travel will be larger than the distance that this wheel has to travel. Of course, we're on a circular arc. This is exactly the example I've shown here. The larger the radius is, the longer the distance you have to travel. So this wheel needs to rotate faster. So if I want to go to the left, I slow down my left wheel or I accelerate my right wheel and don't change the other one. So that will set different motion commands to these platforms. So in this case, I can actually drive on a straight line and on a circular arc. Are there any constraints with respect to that circle I can drive on? Is there a maximum turning radius or minimum turning radius that I can need to take into account, need to consider? <coughs> so if you think with a car, a car cannot make arbitrarily small turns, for example. You can set your maximum steering angle of the car, you press the gas pedal, and your car is rotating, and there's a certain minimum turning radius that you have. How is this here? Yeah? Exactly. That's one of the interesting things you can do here. Actually, this system can turn on spot. So it has no minimum turning radius. What do I need to do in order to let that system spin on its own position, so around that center, so that my rotation center actually sits inside the platform? How do I need to control both of the platform in order to do this? Yeah? Exactly, exactly. Both need to have the same velocity, but one wheel is going forward, one wheel is backward. And then the system is actually spinning on its same place. Okay? So it's actually pretty interesting because it's <coughs> it means compared to a regular car, we have some advantages in, in terms of navigation because we can make arbitrarily small turns. So if you have a system that needs to navigate in very confined spaces, then those wheels, those drives are advantages compared to the Ackermann steering that you would actually use on your car. So there are some interesting properties that those systems have. And they're actually quite easy to, to build. So you just have two wheels with two motors. The important thing here is that the axis coincides of both wheels. Because if the axis coincides, that means whatever motion command you give, the axis will always coincide and therefore meet at one, always in one point, which is my instantaneous center of curvature. Okay. Okay, for those guys running late, we start at 8.15. Please be here on time, otherwise you miss the first 15 minutes and this is not for your own advantage. Thank you. Okay, so we have that drive, this kind of illustration. 
We have the two wheels, the right wheel, the left wheel. We can set typically the velocity of these wheels, so a forward velocity and a backward velocity. We typically have a distance between those two wheels, which is typically called L. So L half is typically my center of mass or my reference uh, for the platform, which sits in the middle of this axis. And then I typically have some external coordinate system, and I can describe this with three parameters, an X coordinate, a Y coordinate, and an orientation of my platform, typically called theta. Okay? So um, by setting those velocities, the platform will turn. This is my theta angle, my x axis, and my y axis in an external reference system. OK, so let's describe this a little bit in more detail. So let's say we can simplify our platform to the setup that I have my two wheels. We kind of see this as a top view. And we want to rotate around this point. So we have velocity command of my, OK, I mixed up left and right. That's Great. <clears throat> okay, uh, so left and right should actually be swapped. Sorry for that. R refers to the radius of my rotation from the ICC to the center of my platform. And again, I have L half, which is the distance from the center to the left wheel or to the right wheel. Okay, so what I can describe now with my basic equation, which was telling me. Um, My velocity is my rotational velocity times r. That's kind of um, how we started. I can say, OK, the velocity of the left wheel, and there it's correct again, just kind of just swap the r and the l over here, um, is the rotation velocity of my platform. So is my rotational velocity of my platform, which is the same. But the radius for this wheel is smaller than the radius for this wheel and different for the one in the middle. So this is r minus l divided by 2 for my left wheel. And for the right velocity, this is my rotation velocity, r plus l divided by 2. OK? So I have two equations. And what I want to do is I can actually switch this off. And we go to the blackboard and try to derive the basic equations for the differential drive where we want to estimate, compute what the radius, how does the radius look like? Later on, where's my instantaneous center of curvature? What's my translation velocity and what's my rotation velocity? Only depending on the size of my platform and the velocity commands that I give to my individual wheels. So that's the goal, that's actually where we want to end up. And we are starting from these two equations. So what I then can do is, I can resolve this with respect to my um, rotation velocity omega. So I have my right velocity divided by r plus l divided by 2. And this must also be equal equivalent to the left-hand side, my left velocity r minus l divided by 2. OK, so this is just resulting from this equation if I divide by the expression in the bracket. So I'll move this over here. I do the same thing over here. And then I know those two must be equal because the platform has the same rotation velocity, the same change in heading per time interval. Okay, so it must be the same for the left and right wheel because this is what my platform actually is. So the next step I can do is can multiply this equation by th with this expression and this expression. So this moves over here, this moves over here. So I have my right velocity times r minus L divided by 2 must be equal to the left velocity r plus L divided by 2. Okay, so just multiplied with the individual expression. Now I can resolve the brackets. So I have uh, right velocity times r minus right velocity times L divided by 2. This must be equal to the left velocity times r plus left velocity times L divided by 2. So then I can move all the elements which have R involved on the left-hand side and the others to the right-hand side. So this is, um, and then I can actually move R out of the equation. So this is the R minus the L. And this must be equal, this moves to the other side. 
So this is L divided by 2 times VR plus VL. Let's see if I made no mistakes in the signs. No, this is all correct. And then I can simply divide by this expression. This expression, so this turns into R equals L2 VR plus VL divided by VR minus VL. And this is the first important finding that we have. That we can compute this radius for this instantaneous center of curvature and only require for this the velocity of the left wheel and the velocity of the right wheel. And we know, need to know the size of the robot. So what's the distance between my our two wheels? This is our L. Okay? So just by knowing the physical properties of our platform and the motion command we send to these individual wheels, we are actually able to control the platform and estimate what is the radius of our circular arc on which we are driving. Okay? This is clear. Basic manipulation of basic equations. Okay. So what we then can do is we can start from the same expression we had over here and sum up the expression on both sides. So step number two, we need to, we want to determine now omega. So here we determined r. So we start from what's written on the first line over there and just sum up the sides. So we have the velocity of the left wheel, the velocity of the right wheel must be equal to omega r minus l divided by 2 plus omega r plus l divided by 2. Right? So taking those two ex expressions over here and simply add it up both of those exp expressions. So this can be written as omega r minus l divided by 2 plus r plus l divided by 2. You can see you have minus l divided by 2 plus l divided by 2. So this nicely simplifies to 2r times omega. Okay, so, so the, this, those two wheels. What I now can simply do is I can simply divide by um, 2r, this expression. So I obtain omega equals velocity on the left-hand side plus velocity on the right-hand side divided by 2r. So what I've done is through combining those two equations and moving the rotation velocity uh, omega on the left-hand side, again, the e equation which only contains the two velocity of the wheels, plus the radius. And the radius is something that we actually computed already. So something that we can actually, we can now do, we can take this radius over here and move it in here. So this expression changes to left velocity, sorry, plus right velocity divided by two times and then this expression over here L divided by two V R plus V L divided by V R minus V L. Okay, now I need a bit more space. Okay. Everyone finished with copying down. So it's also on the slide, so you don't need to copy everything down. Uh, I this also, the derivation is also on the slides. But I just thought here for the exercise and the lecture, it's actually better to go through it manually. Okay, what we now can do is this 2 goes away, L remains, this one, 1 divided by 1 divided by this expression, this expression goes up, and in the end, those two actually cancel out. So we have omega is equals to, okay, let's make one extra step in there, right velocity plus left velocity. 
times right velocity minus left velocity. And then we have L times right velocity plus left velocity. So this cancels out as well. So this equals 2 VR minus VL divided by L. And this is exactly my equation for omega. So what we have, we have now an expression for omega, which only depends on the speeds that are set to the individual wheels. And what I now can do with this, I can also compute the velocity of my platform. Because we said that our velocity is our rotation velocity times the radius. So I can put the radius and the velocity, combine them. So this is nothing else than vr minus vl divided by 2 times the radius that I had before, which was um, vr plus vl divided by vr minus vl times L divided by 2. You can see again, this cancels out. Some, oh, this is also an, this is an L. Not a 2. This L and this L cancels out so that the velocity of my platform turns out to be VR plus VL divided by 2, which is the average velocity of the two wheels. Okay, so what we've seen here is what intu intuitively makes sense. We can control the left and the right wheel, and this determines the velocity of my platform. And the velocity of the platform, the end velocity, is just the average velocity of the two wheels. If both wheels go forward with the same velocity, also the average is the same, and I'm moving forward what we said. Same for moving backward. Also, if we have one wheel spinning forward, the other one spinning backward, both with the same velocity, we said we are turning on the spot, and this actually corresponds to the velocity of zero, because whatever, plus a meter per second forward, minus a meter per second forward divided by two is zero. So what we can do is we can compute the velocity of the platform, and we can compute the radius, and we compute our rot rotation velocity, and with this we obviously can compute our instantaneous center of curvature. So just with knowing the size of the platform and with controlling the speed of the wheels, we are actually able to determine all the quantities that we want to have. Again, the derivation that I've shown you on the blackboard is also completely on the slides. Step one, as we have using those two equations, resolving them to omega and doing our derivation, which is our first result. What does the radius look like? And the second step is we take the two equations, we add those two equations up, which gave us this equation over here, we then could move towards omega so that we have get our result for our velocity for omega. Then we still have this r in here, which we don't want to have in here because we want to boil down everything to velocities and the distance l. So we to use the first result and actually move it in there. That was the stuff that we had done here. And this gives us our rotational velocity now only depending on the real velocities and L, and then we can compute our, for the velocity of the platform of the center of mass and resulting in the average of the two velocities. Okay, so in sum, we have our translation velocity, our rotation velocity, and the radius of the curve that we are actually driving on. Okay, and with this, we can obviously compute our instantaneous center of curvature, so this position over here, by just saying, so this point here is the x and y position of my platform. And then I know that the uh, point must lie on the axis of the, two, of the two wheels. So I simply move from here, if, so this assumes we do a left turn, minus the radius. And so this is the minus sign of the orientation, which points in this direction. And I will actually obtain this point over here and I do the same for the x and y coordinate, one with sine and one with cosine. So given the current position of the platform here, x, y, and orientation theta, I can, with this simple equation, compute my instantaneous center of curvature just by 
using the standard motion equation. You need to go 90 degrees to the left. Therefore, I change the cosine to the sine and take the radius into account how far I'm away from the point, point I'm rotating to. So this only holds for a left turn. Of course, if you would do a right turn, you have to be careful with your signs. You need to flip a sign, but the rest of this stays the same. Okay? So with this, you can estimate the circle you're rotating around. And this information we can then actually use in order to in for the, infer the forward kinematics of our platform. So if you now think this as systems at multiple points in time, so we have a point time, time t where the platform is over here, it generates a certain motion command, the platform is at the next point in time over here. How can I actually compute this motion? So how can I compute xt plus 1 based on xt? So if I only take, just for simplification of the notation, this xt here only encodes the x and y location and theta is done separately. Um, this is a rotation matrix, the rotation matrix around the kind of z-axis it would be in 3D, but if we're in 2D, we have only one rotation axis, so standing orthogonal on the xy plane. And this is rotated, we rotate by the rotation velocity times delta t, so the, the, the rotation velocity plus the time interval, so between t plus 1 and t, so the, the actual time difference, these are time steps, and this delta t is supposed to be the actual difference in time. So this gives me by how much I need to rotate around this point. The rotation center is the instantaneous center of curvature, so I need to take my point xt, move it over here. This is basically the shift. Then I'm rotating it, and then I'm shifting it back again. And the change in the orientation is just my new heading is my old heading times uh, plus delta. There's an omega missing, omega delta t, because the, obviously the rotation velocity matters. So I'm sorry, I forgot the omega over here. So, and with this equation, I can, given that I know I was here at time t, and given I know my, my motion commands, I can actually end up, I will end up here. If we think about this in a general case, where we don't have individual steps, we would think about velocities and integrating over velocities and taking into account the change in the orientation. So if you want to have thesis as kind of something which is completely continuous, you actually need to integrate this. So what we have done here is at discrete points in time, time one, time two, and we assume during this period the system executes exactly the same motion, so it's not changing its velocity during this point in time, then we can do this with discrete steps. If we have a continuous profile, what we have in reality, we actually have to integrate over this. Okay? So with this, we're actually able to infer where the where's the platform at the next point in time. So an another type of platform besides this differential drive is a drive which uh, looks like this, which has four wheels, and those four wheels are all fixed on the platform. So there is no steering angle that you can actually generate. It's also called a skid steering. And it's also a very popular platform, especially for slightly racked platforms. Because the good thing is you don't have any control mechanism for your, for your steering angle, so the wheels can be fixed. They typically can have a high payload, and you just have four motors attached, one motor to every wheel. The wheels can't change. The question is, how can I actually steer such a platform? Because we don't have really a steering angle, and so all the wheels go in the same direction. So the question now is, how can we actually make this platform drive in a nice way? You can control everything on this platform. In this example, you can control the velocity of the wheels, and you can set them. The question is, how do you actually make this platform move on something else in a straight line, let's say? I mean, going in a straight line is trivial. You just give the same velocity to all the wheels. But what do you need to do if you want to move away from a straight line? Any ideas? Yeah. What happens if I put different speeds on the left and the right wheel? What happens? I do this. Starting the turn on the slower side. It will start turning the lower side. But what happens? What, what happens in with respect to this instantaneous center of curvature we just discussed? Where does my instantaneous center of curvature sit for this platform? Not in the so. Exactly. 
the axes don't intersect. You have one axis which sits over here and one axis which sits over here. You can see this. Basically, there's two differential drives attached to each other in the same orientation. Therefore, some people call this robot a kinematic mistake. Because whatever you do, you cannot reach the configuration that the two axes actually intersect. So there is no instantaneous center of curvature where all the axes of all the wheels intersect. This means this system will skid on the ground. Therefore, it's also called skid steering. So you will have a very bumpy movement, and you actually have a very It's not very gentle to your ground, let's say, this way, this platform, because actually the wheels will cause a lot of friction on the ground, because one thing is moving forward, the other one is moving backward. And therefore, those systems are typically not used in indoor environments, at least when they have driving under heavy payload, because it will simply ruin your ground or your wheels, depending on what's kind of more rocked your ground or your wheels. So if you drive this one on a nice wooden parquet floor, then uh, you can redo your floor quite quickly. Um, and therefore, but this is a platform which is pretty good for rough outdoor environments, where you don't need to turn that often or don't need to be very gentle with your environment. Uh, for those setups, you can actually find those platforms. We also have exactly this platform in the lab, the two of them actually. Um, it's quite a nice platform, but from the kind of control point of view of setting motion commands, turning is not the, the most beautiful thing with those types of platforms. Also pretty loud when they do that. Okay? Any questions up to this point? So we've discussed differential drive is kind of the standard, beautiful, easy to model, easy to build platform, which is often used especially for inner navigation systems. We described all the basic laws of motion, at least as soon as we are not as long as we're not sliding or anything like this. So auto move this platform gently through the environment and very very briefly discussed this type of platform. What I want to do next, I'm do this after the break, is look what happens if we actually go to vehicles. So what happens if you go to a car? How does this change? What do we need to take into account? Because there the physics changes quite a little bit. And um, we need to, because we can't really control a rotation of velocity at least on its own. And therefore, we need to uh, find a better way or look deep, dive into something which is called the Ackermann drive or Ackermann steering. But we do this after a five minute break. And so you have five minutes time to relax, let some fresh air, and then we're going to continue. Thank you. Okay, everyone, welcome to part two, looking into the Ackermann drive, which is basically the question, what happens if we are going with a car-like platform? So again, what's the important thing in here? We have four wheels. Those wheels cannot move or cannot, cannot steer. And the front wheels have a steering angle they can take. So we're saying, okay, go five degrees to the left-hand side. Wheels will turn, and if I then set a velocity to the command to so actuate my motors, the vehicle will actually turn on a curve. So I can turn the steering wheel and change the steering angle as long as I don't drive, as long as I have a zero velo forward velocity, nothing is happening. The second thing which is important, I have a minimum turning radius. So even if I could, what I can't do in reality, could change my steering angle to 90 degrees, I would still have a turning radius because I would still rotate around with my back wheels, basically. Um, and so what happens is that you have a, turning ang uh, a steering angle, which is typically quite limited, and therefore you have a minimum turning radius that you can do. So next thing is let's kind of try to describe mathematically how we can actually do this. And the first thing we can actually do is assume this is our vehicle. This is a forward direction. We have our four wheels over here. And the first thing one typically does, one defines um, a virtual wheel sitting behind the two wheels in the back, and this defines the um, center of reference for the car, for the car on a reference frame. So the axis between the two wheels in the back, in the middle of this axis, this is your reference frame. So if we describe a tra trajectory of a vehicle, we typically describe it at this point. So in this case, this may be the trajectory that the vehicle was well, ha um, has been driving here in, um, in blue. And so this is the motion and this is the, the point which, where the car describes a point on that trajectory. 
This doesn't really help us a lot for our steering command that we need to set. And what we want to do for now, just to simplify our life a little bit, remove the Ackermann, or simplify the Ackermann model to something which is called a bicycle model, which is basically the same than the Ackermann model, except that you just have one wheel here. So we can see this also as a bicycle with one wheel. It's very similar. You can turn your uh, steering, um, and then your wheel turns, and then you can go to the left or to the right-hand side. And then what you actually will generate if you just turn this wheel, which is also called the ideal wheel, it's a simplification. Let's draw it to the blackboard. Um, so this is our axis. This is the axis which is constant and cannot change. And let's say we do here in our ideal wheel, this is our ideal wheel. It would be somewhere over here. Down here would be our instantaneous center of curvature. So the intersection of the axis of the front wheel and the axis of the back wheel. And so in this simple bicycle model, this will always be the case. So those two axes will always intersect. Unless they are parallel, and that means you're driving a straight line and we don't, don't need an instantaneous center of curvature. But as, long as, as soon as we set some steering angle of the front wheel, we will always have the effect that those two axes intersect in one point. We just have two axes. Everything is easy and simple. And we don't suffer from any further problem. Okay. Okay, now we can actually have our two other wheels here, our car wheels. Let's add those wheels in reality as our real wheels. The good thing is nothing changes because the axis of those wheels will be exactly the same. And so the axis doesn't change. And we will have the setup here that we will also have a nice intersection of my um, of the axis of the of my ideal front wheel and all the wheels in the back and I have my instantaneous center of curvature there's nothing I can actually screw up in this setup okay so what happens now if I add the two wheels here from my real wheels, moving away from the ideal wheel. How oh, this is called. What is expected to happen? Any ideas? What do you expect? Yeah? They have to have a different turning angle, so they still intersect in the ICC. I expect. Mm -hmm. One hypothesis. They need to have different steering angles. Have you ever checked your car? If you turn steering wheel, do you actually generate different angles for the right and the left wheel? Okay. What do others think? What's your expectation? Different speeds. Different speeds. Why do we think we need different speeds? I mean, it's a guess, but I would like to have an, try an explanation for that guess. For the down wheel. Yeah? If the inner wheel has to have a smaller... Why? Because we don't have the same angle of velocity, right? Different ranges. Exactly. So the vehicle has the same angular velocity, and one wheel, the outer wheels, are further away, so they need to go faster. So this is correct. I want to come back to your explanation. We need to have different steering commands for the, for the left and the right wheel. Is it the case or is it not the case? Who thinks this is the case? That we have different steering angles for the left and the right wheel. Who thinks they are the same? And all the others have no idea? So who thinks they are different? One, two. Who thinks they are the same? Majority. Okay. Very well done. Your car actually generates different steering angles for the right and the left wheel. Because otherwise, you won't have the ICC. And I just have a short illustration of this over here. So what you see here is this is your ideal wheel. This is your back wheel. If you're turning this wheel, and you would turn those in exactly the same angle than the ideal wheel, so what you set with your steering angle, then 
This would be the trajectories of your vehicles if they would move in an unconstrained way. And you can see these trajectories would lead to issues with your car. Either you break your car or your tires will slide sidewards over the ground, which is also something you typically don't want to have while driving. So the only way to fix this is actually to set different steering commands uh, for the different wheels. So the wheels need to have different steering commands. And this was also one of the problems where this was the original problem. It was on the horse wagons, where you had old horse wagons, where you need to turn the steering for the front wheels of your, of your horse wagon. And in the very old days, those wheels were actually breaking pretty often. You saw those wheels actually detaching from the axis. And the reason for this is that they were actually setting, in the old setups, the same, what you, all, most of you have done intuitively, setting the same angle, steering angle, to the left and to the right wheel. And this caused either the wheels to detach from the axis or the wheels to re slide sidewards and wear off really, really quickly because you don't get a smooth rolling motion. In addition to that, it gets very bumpy if you're sitting in the seat of, of such a vehicle. So what you need to do, you need to have something like this. So you need to have set different steering angles for the ideal wheel, which doesn't exist, but that's actually the thing you set with your, with your steering wheel. If you have the steering wheel in your hand, you basically set your ideal, or the steering angle of the ideal wheel. And this must be translated to a steering of my left and my right wheel. The one in the back, keep fixed. And this will then lead to trajectories as you can see here always, it doesn't even need to be the case that the, the trajectory for the back wheel and the front wheel, ideal wheel, are the same. They can actually differ. To really differ down too much, but they can differ. In the end, every wheel has its own, describes its own circle. The only thing is, all those circles, the center of all those circles must be the same. If the centers are not the same, either it feels quite bumpy, your navigation, and your material wears off quite quickly. Okay? So you need to now define how to set those steering angles. How to make sure I set the left steering angle and the right steering angle in the right way to get the motion I actually want. Okay, let's start again with the ideal wheel. So let's say we want to rotate around this point over here. And let's say this delta is now our steering angle. So we set a small delta over here. What can we do in terms of basic trigonometry to get more insights about how to set the steering angle of my car to actually generate a radius of uh, a circle with a certain radius? So what do we know? One thing, yeah? Okay, so we know that the instantaneous set of curvature must, be, must lie on this blue line over here. Because this is the line uh, of my back axis, and this is fixed, this cannot change. So it must, be, must lie somewhere on this blue line. And I also know I need to set my, the steering angle of my ideal wheel. So this is the virtual wheel, which doesn't exist in reality, but the called ideal wheel that you're controlling with your, when you have your steering a wheel in your hand. So by, let's say, we turn the steering wheel by five degrees and then the ideal wheel tilts by five degrees. It's not like, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping in reality, but just for our, um, for simplification of our illustration. Okay, so we will turn it a little bit to the left. We just want to go on a left turn. Um, and this will actually generate an intersection of those two lines. So how do I get What's the relationship between the angle that I set, so a steering wheel, and this radius over here? See any geometric relation which allows you to describe that? Could you repeat that? I was the angles of the angle is equal to R. Yeah. Okay, why? So we want that up here. So this is our angle that we actually have in here. So the angle also pops up over here. Can extend this. So then we have 
similar, tr similar triangles, so we know that this over here is the same angle than this angle over here. So it's kind of the first insight that is kind of, or this is the most important insight. So we can map this angle over here to this angle over here. And then we have a triangle which sits over here with the right angle over here. This is the angle that we know, or that we, that we set. This over here is the length or the distance between the two axes of our car. It's basically the size of the vehicle that we assume to know. And then this is our radius. Right? So what we can do is we can set up the relationship that the tangent of this angle must be this length d, so the distance of the wheels of our car, divided by the radius. So what we actually get is this relationship over here, which then allows us to have a direct relationship between the radius and our steering angle. Okay, so d is a constant, and we can either say, what do I need to do in order to, to, to drive a circle with a radius of 30 meters? Then you can compute your steering angle, or you can use it the other way around, giving a steering angle that you set, what is the radius that you're actually driving. So you actually get this relationship there. Now we can repeat this process by adding our real wheels, the left wheel and the, le and the right front wheel, or as we have written in here, our inner wheel and our outer wheel. So what you see right now, in order to make sure that those three wheels actually lead to an intersection of the axis in this single point, I mean this one here, the one in the middle doesn't exist in reality, but those two exist in reality, those two wheels. So we have three lines in the 2D world and we need to make sure that these three lines intersect in one point in order to generate a smooth motion. And this will lead to the fact that we will have a different steering angle for the inner as well as for the outer wheel. So what is the relationship now for the steering command of the inner wheel or the outer wheel? Exactly, so we have exactly the same triangle relationship we had for the ideal wheel. This distance d is the same because the wheels have the same distance, but the only thing which changes is actually the radius. And the radius just decreases or increases by half of the width of my vehicle, because this is the, the distance of the radius. So, the, so far I was taking this point into account, which was the middle of the car, so the width of the car divided by two gives me the left wheel, and the width of the car uh, plus half of the width of the car gives me the radius of the right wheel. Okay, so this means the equations stay basically the same, except that for the, ra the radius is replaced by the radius plus minus L divided by 2, so the width of my vehicle. Okay? And so with this, I can set with my steering uh, wheel, kind of the angle of the ideal wheel, and this is then translated into two different steering commands. So if you do this on a nowadays completely automized or electric, uh, let's say call it non-mechanical uh, vehicle, that's easy. You can actually set individual steering commands electronically to, to, your, to your vehicle and this will do that. That's not, a, that's not a big deal. But I was telling you that this actually has been invented a long, long time ago in the time when we still were using horse wagons. How to do this if you have a horse wagon? This means there's nothing where I can easily put a tangent, tangent somewhere and adapt the steering wheel of the left and the right wheel. At least it appears like this. The good thing is that a few smart person who figured that out found actually a mechanical way for doing this. And so what actually happens is you have your front and your back wheel and this is kind of the, the rotation axis where your car sits and you, you put an extra typically metal bar over here which controls your steering and a controlling bar over here and the steering wheel actually changes the position of this metal bar so it can move the metal bar to the left and to the right. And the angle of this line, the rest of this line is done in a way that it intersects in the middle behind the two wheels in the back. So it's kind of a virtual line. 
So what you're now doing by moving this bar to the left hand side, you actually mechanically generate this effect that those two wheels are turning and they are turning at a different rate and this is exactly the rate that generates your, uh, that th those two lines intersect in this instantaneous center of curvature. So maybe some of you remember, at least if you have my age, when we were kids there were these small cars for kids called Ketka, which you could actually drive on. And if you think back, they exactly had this steering because they had exactly the same effect. There was a second bar, sometimes it sits in front, sometimes it sits in here, and your steering angle, the nice thing is you could actually see that car uh, because there was nothing around, you could directly touch it. By turning your steering wheel, there was basically um, a metal kind of rubber bar or rubber metal construction which was moving this to the left and to the right. And this caused actually different steering angles for the left and the right wheel and this allowed you to drive smoothly with your small vehicle through the environment. And this was a major revolution for Volkswagens at that time because it made the, the, the drive much more comfortable and led to a much smaller wear off of those wheels. Again, um, today the setup of the cars is typically differently. You can control this electronically. There are even more advanced things you can do that you explicitly have motors on all of the wheels and set different velocities to keep the car as stable as possible. So as soon as you go to uh, dynamic driving situations, um, this model also breaks quite quickly. Um, and you need to make sure the wheels don't slip uh, in, in different control systems like ESP, for example, to keep your vehicle on the, on the road uh, without sliding. This makes it more complicated, but as long as you are driving not at high speeds, the Ackermann drive is actually a very solid thing you can do. Okay? So this is kind of the mechanical realization on at least how in the old days Ackermann steerings have been, have been built. Which brings me to a few special drives that you sometimes find in mobile systems as well. The, the other one is the synchronous drive, which is actually you have multiple wheels which are all pointing to the same direction, but you have one mechanism which can turn the wheels. So there's another motor which turns all the wheels and all in the same way. So you can actually turn your wheels on the spot all exactly in the same way. And this can actually lead to, what you, the nice thing is what you can uh, do with those platforms is even though the platform drives forward or you, you, you have the vision of the, the platform driving forward, you can change the, all the wheels at the same point in time and the, the, the platform can actually move, do movements like this. So you have a very flexible and agile movement. So basically you can take every possible configuration in the space you can quite easily take. You still have kinematic constraints so you can't go straight and immediately turn to the right. So there are some dynamics, uh, constraints on dynamics, resulting from the dynamics, but you can actually reach every position in the state space. Control again gets a little bit more complicated, so you need to again start with the general equations of integrating over velocities, and then what typically do in practice, you make assumptions that whatever, within 200 milliseconds, you assume everything to be constant, so your movements are actually sequences of circular arcs attached, which allows you to describe the movement of those systems in, in a quite nice way. Um, another very popular drive, which was first coming out in the XO4000, and you still find today in some specialized vehicles, is similar to an Ackermann steering, but you not steer only the front wheels, you also steer your back wheels. So what happens is actually you can turn your steering wheel, and not only the front wheels turns, for example, here to the right, those will actually turn to the left. So if you go forward, you're reducing your turning radius. Because these, these are not parallel, so this would actually be okay, illustration over here. So if these wheels were parallel, the ICC would be st somewhere down there and you would have a large turning radius. By rotating also the back wheels, you can actually move the ICC closer to the vehicle. That means you can do smaller turns. So this is again something you find rarely, but sometimes find on off-road vehicles that you also can steer your back wheels, um, especially if you drive in very confined spaces. The coolest drive that you can actually find is this one, which is called the mechanum wheel drive, which um, is kind of wheels on wheels. So what you have here is you have four controlled wheels on each side, and it has wheels on top of them, and those wheels are arranged in approximately a 45 degree rotation. Um, so those small wheels are passive wheels, so they just, they're not actuated, there's no motor involved in this, and 
through the way you control the velocity of those wheels, the small wheels on top will turn differently just based on the, on the, on the friction on the ground. When I first saw that when I was a student, I said, okay, what kind of stupid drive is this? Why, why should that work? Why should that be a good idea? Um, it turns out it's a very brilliant idea and a very brilliant drive um, because what it can do, it can do any arbitrary motion. And what are you controlling? You're basically only, you had four different motors which are actuated, which are those wheels, one, two, three, one, zero, one, two, three. And you can add or uh, control those velocities separately, which gives you velocity in the x direction. So if um, x is here seen in the ego motion frame, so if I'm the vehicle, this is the x axis, this is the y axis, and this is my rotational axis. So you can set a velocity in x, you can set a velocity in y, and you can set a rotational velocity all at the same point in time. You have three velocities you can control, change in x, change in y, change in theta, but you have four motors. So there's one degree of freedom too much in there. And this is something which is called an error velocity. And you need to make sure that this error velocity is zero. It's an additional constraint that you have. Otherwise, you are ruining your wheels or your ground. And those wheels are very hard, so you start ruining your ground. And I just have a small video which shows you how this system drives. Um, so what you can do is, um, you can see those wheels are actuated, and you can see sometimes when it's driving fast, you can see those small wheels actually spinning. And uh, what you can see is, you should be repeating, oh, okay, it's repeating. Um, so this, this experiment was done for something else, but what you can see how the system goes sideward, forward, rotates while driving, and it's a very agile, very beautiful to see platform, which can drive in super confined spaces and can solve a lot of complex navigation tasks, or they get much, much simpler because you can control the platform in any arbitrary way without needing to take into account the um, dynamics like for a car. So you can think this is a car. Let's say you have a car and you have a very, very small parking spot. What you could do if your car would have an omni drive, you could just drive next to the parking spot and then slide into the side. This is pretty nice. And compared to that, if you compare this from the complexity of the underlying planning problem to steering an Ackermann drive where you have to go forwards and back, to slightly enter the parking lot, that becomes much easier. And therefore, those drives are becoming more and more popular. They're not the cheapest to produce, and you need to control your error, error velocity quite well to not ruin your, your floor, your ground. But in industrial environments, where you anyway have very strong grounds or um, concrete grounds, um, this is actually a very effective platform for performing navigation tasks. Okay, so by now, we have seen the most popular drives that you will actually find in most mobile platforms that actually have wheels. What you sometimes also have are um, tracked vehicles. So this is an example of a tracked vehicle that we built, have been building here a while back. So this is basically a tracked platform for rock navigation. And you can go climb stairs up and down. And basically, it's a track-based system, one track on the left and one track on the right-hand side. And this is actually something which is very similar to this skid steering vehicle, where you have the, the two wheels. None of the tracks can turn. Um, it has a lot of friction on the ground, so if this thing actually turns on spot, you're putting a lot of forces on the vehicle and on the ground. Uh, so doing rotations is not the nicest thing on Earth with those platforms, but they have their advantages if you have a good traction with the ground and you want to navigate things like staircases, which is much more tricky to do with a, with a wheel platform, you can actually do with um, a track platform in, an, in a quite easy way. Um, most of the systems that we have today actually use wheels. Um, of course, you can have flying platforms, um, then you can, the, the dynamics change completely. Um, but there are one other group of, of robotic systems, which are so called humanoid robots, which try to emulate humans. And this is one example of a lagged system. Um, so in this case, this is doing some planning and localization tasks in order to climb those staircases. Um, so you need to have a pretty good perception system to estimate where the edges are of those staircases and then align the platform and do movements for, for example, climbing up the stairs and, um, and moving upwards. So this is kind of the navigation capabilities that a small-scale commercially available platform has. Uh, that's a work probably eight years ago, something like this. Um, and what the systems can do, they can actually move their legs. This is here a so-called um, statically stable movement. That means in all points in time, the system is stable. Um, we humans can walk in a statically stable way as well. That means whenever we stop, we are stable. But we can also do this in a dynamically stable way, just through our dynamics, especially when we are running. 
We are not always in a, in a stable state. Only through the dynamics that we have, we are actually stable. Um, there are more modern platforms. So I would say the most advanced platform that we actually find today is something from Boston Dynamics, which is uh, uh, a company of control experts. And maybe you've seen this platform. It's called the Atlas platform, um, which can actually do things. So this is not faked uh, things. They can do pretty nice movements. You can see these are dynamically stable movement because you use the dynamics of the system in order to stabilize the movement. Um, so there's nothing you can very easily build. This is a very small number of platforms uh, which are actually capable of doing this. You need to invest in artificial muscles which can take energy and release energy in a nice way. Um, the system can even jump. Um, there are a lot of pretty complex problems involved in order to do this and doing the control for a platform like this is um, actually something which is pretty tricky, let's say that way. And there, I'm not sure if there's any company outside Boston Dynamics which is actually able to do that. And of course, there are also videos where the system fails, so it doesn't work 100% of the time. But you can really see here how you need to have an understanding of dynamics and an understanding of uh, how your control systems actually work in order to make things like this happen. Okay, um, just a few words before um, ending this chapter. There are certain kind of constraints which um, people refer to. Um, and they are kind of non-holonomic constraints or holonomic constraints, so different types of constraints that one can refer to depending on what kind of constraint you're actually interested in. So one of the things is non-holonomic constraints basically limit the possible movements within the configuration space of the platform. So there are certain configurations that um, the platform cannot take into account. So for example, if you think about the differential drive that we had before, we can drive on any circular arc, but we cannot move sidewards. Right? We cannot move 90 degrees to the right or the left hand side, also with the vehicle. Even, the, even a, a car cannot even take any circular trajectory because we are limited in the circles that we can actually drive. And so these are systems with non-holonomic constraints because they cannot execute any arbitrary movement in the configuration space. The mechanical wheel drive, that's different. So there may also be some constraints with, riding, with respect to how quickly I can change my accelerations of the motors, but in theory can take any arbitrary configuration. I can move sidewards, so the possible configurations are actually not limited with respect to certain configurations I cannot take into account. Um, there are other constraints, so-called holonomic constraints. Um, these are constraints which reduce the possibilities in your configuration space. So for example, if you have a train which sits on tracks, there are certain configurations in configuration space that you cannot reach. And this is something which is called a holonomic constraint because there are physical constraints to that system that you can't reach certain configurations. Again, this is different from non-holonomic constraints. So my example with not being able to move uh, with a vehicle or with a, with a differential drive to move sidewards um, is different because there means I simply cannot move sidewards but I may find a different trajectory to actually reach that space. So what I could do if I have a very confined space I could rotate. I can move into the place and it can rotate again. So I can actually reach this configuration although I cannot do any arbitrary movement. But the holonomic constraint is something that the system is physically not able to actually reach this configuration space. And this can be the case if you have trains on tracks, for example, or if you have certain trailer systems, so systems which pull other systems. Um, given the physical configuration of your trailer, you cannot reach certain configurations. And so if you are, um, if you're, if you're describing a system, you always need to make sure what kind of constraints the system has. So which states are reachable? Are there non holonomic constraints involved? Are there holonomic constraints involved? Or it's a system which is actually free of all those constraints, which is, of course, the easiest way. If something is free of constraints, there are certain things you don't need to take into account during planning, for example. So if you plan optimal trajectories, systems without constraints are the easiest systems to use because you basically from, can reach every possible configuration and potentially can reach them very easily and not needing to take into account um, very complex movement. Um, something which is actually the kind of this turns into the starting point of the next lecture is how can we actually integrate this information over time? So what we have done right now, we said, okay, we can describe how a vehicle moves, what the constraints are, 
But what is the next configuration given my previous configuration? And of course, what we can do is we can use the, the models that we have by saying, OK, we have a translation velocity, we have a rotational velocity, we execute this for a certain amount of time, and that means we, are, we will reach some place. And we can actually compute this place. And this is typically something that is referred to as dead reckoning. Because what we're doing, we're basically setting, veloci setting a velocity for a certain measure of the time and then say, OK, we are dri driven one meter per second forward for one second, so we should have advanced by one meter. This is actually a pretty noisy thing to do. What happens in reality is that you use something which we often refer to as odometry, where you have explicit encoders in your motors which actually count the revolutions of your wheels. And this allows you to much better track how far have you gone. And then odometry is a task of integrating this information over time. And typically, odometry is more precise than dead reckoning information. Nevertheless, also dead reckoning inf or odometry information is very noisy. So this is an example of a kind of a trajectory that a platform has been driven in a maze. Doesn't really matter what the exact trajectory looks like. So the platform over here navigating, or actually coming down from here, navigating through, through a maze. And this is basically the, the actual trajectory that the platform was taking. If you, however, integrate the information just coming from the wheels into account in order to see where the platform was moving, then your trajectory actually looked like this. Well, you can see here the platform actually had, had a drift. It was slightly drifting to the right-hand side here. So you could see it was slightly going to the right-hand side. At least the ego motion estimate was completely, not completely, but was pretty inaccurate. And not enough in order to estimate your pose over time accurately. Again, this is not the best odometry. Depending on how much money you're willing to invest into your encoders, you get better or worse qualities if they're calibrated or uncalibrated. But this is one way for having an additional source of where you are just based on your motion. And what we will look into next week is actually a probabilistic description of those movements. So how can we define probability distributions that allow me to estimate how likely it is to end up in that place? In the most simple case, this could be a Gaussian distribution about the place. But as it turns out, Gaussian distribution is typically not sufficient to take those motions into account. So we will look into different forms of probability distributions, which are typically Gaussians combined with some nonlinear functions, in order to find a way for representing the, the probability distribution about where the other platform is. Having such a probability distribution is then important for state estimation problems. If you want to estimate where we are, for example, using a Kalman filter or using a particle filter, the two approaches that we will discuss in the lecture here, we need to have probability distributions as our prediction model, something you've seen in the base filter presented by Nivet probably two weeks ago, um, describing what is your prediction step in terms of a probability distribution in order to update it with your observations. And for this, you need to have both probability distributions. The one which makes the prediction of where the platform is, just taking into account, for example, the, the wheel encoders. And then you will use your observation, like your camera or your laser rangefinder, in order to update your belief. And this is then integrated into a Bayesian recursive state estimation technique. And for this, these, taking those errors, those, the, the noisy movements into account, is something which is relevant and something we are going to discuss next week. So with this, I'm coming to the end of today. And what the, my goal was that you should learn today is an idea how different wheel platforms can actually move through the environment. What are constraints that you need to take into account? This is most importantly the ICC that you need to uh, satisfy in order to get a good smooth motion of your vehicle. Then mathematical ways for describing how the platform moves based on what the configuration of my wheels. Most of the movements in 2D we can actually reduce to a translation velocity and a rotation velocity. They can be independent of each other as in the example for the um, differential drive, but they can also be dependent in the example of the Ackermann drive, where you cannot set a rotational velocity without setting a translation velocity. So there's a tight coupling between those. Um, and you've seen, at least, that they're kind of more complex or more advanced drive for special applications, although we haven't dived deeply into this. And I would argue with the differential drive and with the Ackermann drive, you can describe 95% of all the vehicles that you will find in reality out there, at least as an approximation. Then we have very briefly described what are constraints, so the difference between non-holonomic constraints and holonomic constraints. Again, the one restricting the motion, the other one's restricting the possible configurations that the system can take in configuration space. And as a starting point, difference between odometry and dead reckoning. Dead reckoning is basically open loop, just saying measuring 
guessing how fast I am or what I said to the motors and measuring the time, which is pretty inaccurate. And odometry typically takes some additional sensors info, into account like encoders, which basically count the revolutions of the wheels and based on the revolutions of the wheels, then estimate where your platform is. And that's kind of the tasks for today. And with this, I'm coming to the end of the lecture for today and we will see each other next week. And then I will dive into the probabilistic motion models and depending on the time, also into sensor models. So providing probabilistic descriptions of how we interpret our motion commands and our sensor data, which will then be the basis for a state estimation like extended common filter localization and particle filter localization. And with this, thank you very much for your attention and we see each other next week.